Welcome to the Conversations That Matter podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you actually heard the guest that we're going to have on today. You're actually hearing that guest right now as I speak uh, because uh, Tim Bushong did the guitar riff intro and outro uh, for the Conversations That Matter podcast. You've also heard, uh, I think this is one of your greatest hits, Tim, uh, the dividing line. Uh, what, what is it called? Radio Free Geneva. You, you do the yeah. intro. Those are your yeah. golden pipe singing. Uh, the great reformer, Martin Luther song, uh, A Mighty Fortress. So um, welcome. Welcome to the podcast that you've been uh, playing on for now over, almost a year. How does it feel to actually be on a podcast that, that you play guitar for? Oh, this is the best. And <laughs> I want to ask you, how does it feel to be uh, talking virtually in a room that you've actually physically sat in? So there. The, uh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> you very meta. Yeah, I was. And actually, there's a recording studio right behind you that people yeah. can kind of see. And uh, it's where there all the, the magic happens. Um, I know. So we're Christians, not magic. All the miracles happen. Uh, well, God's providential. We're not musical. we're not Pentecostals. Right. So the prov you're right. Right. His sovereignty carries out in that room. Sovereign plan. There we uh, go. Anyway, uh, did it just introduce people to you and what you're doing. You're a pastor now. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I'm going to be at your church. I was there last fall, but in Syracuse, Indiana, on October 22nd is the Jesus and Politics Conference this year. Um, at part three. Yeah. Part, part three. Yeah. Uh, at Syracuse Baptist Church. And um, and so you you live uh, close to there. I know I've, I've been at your house and, and uh, we broke bread together. Uh, yeah. But you're you, you weren't always a pastor. You were uh, you, you were a Christian rocker. And you were part of the band Love War. Uh, some people might remember that and, and know that band. Um, and then the Channel Surfers. And then you've done some solo projects as well that I have, uh, Christmas and hymns. And um, so uh, why don't you just introduce us a little bit to talk about that, uh, that transition, uh, you know, your, your rocker days and then going from that to be a pastor. Uh, did, did you have to settle it down a little bit or were you able to keep that intensity in the pulpit? I, I could probably... I could probably uh, point you to 10 people that wish I had settled it down a bit. But, uh, <laughs> no, actually uh, began, uh, you know, played music at a very young age, uh, all the usual. I was born in 60, so kind of coming up through the 70s and, and junior proms and freshman cotillions and all that kind of thing. Always hard rock, you know, rock and roll. And uh, I, I've been raised in the church and I am just... I can't tell you how grateful I am for my church upbringing, but during those days, I just, I thought it was kind of irrelevant watch your P's and Q's and Sunday morning. And then the rest of the week really isn't spiritual. And you know, you know go, go have some fun, go be adventurous. And it's uh, kind of what I did. Um, and so I was in music, got married in 83. You met my wife and she's the best rock and roll wife a guy could ever ask for. And in 87, I, I finally had just had it. I repented, truly gave my life to Christ. Uh, whether that was a, you know, that, that was it, or just me being like Jonah saying, all right, I give up Lord, with quite a combination of both. So I kind of put music down. I thought that was my thing. Let's, let's get into the word. Let's learn what this faith is that I knew to be true. And then around 90, I started uh, writing again and really started coming up with a bunch of material you know, a few albums worth, and we began the band Love War. It went through many different incarnations, and uh, we got a record deal with the Elefante Brothers on Pachyderm, and uh, a lot of critical acclaim. Uh, people would say, well, thanks for writing stuff that doesn't insult my intelligence. It's like I can play it for my pagan friends, and they, they get it because it's street cred. Of course, the philosophy there was – um, I don't think it's quite where, where Vody Bauckham goes with it, you know, the bait and switch. It's right. more about uh, being able to play skillfully and doing so in any context that exists. We would play nightclubs, bars, uh, youth groups, whatever, and do so in a way that then at the end of the show, when your last song is done, and you pepper, pepper the performance with, uh, with exhortations and things of that nature. And that way you give the gospel and you give it without any hesitation, no blushing, mm -hmm. no apologies. Well, then that burnt banter and channel surfers. Um, I'm in my late thirties. We've got three kids and I was at the same time teaching um, a college class at the church. I that we were members of. 
and it just got to the point where, okay, my, my kids need their dad at home. I, I basically live a truck driver's schedule. Um, so I decided to get off the road and, uh, that's when I transferred to what you see behind you on the other side of the glass, engineering, producing and recording. And it wasn't until, uh, 2005, 2006, where we, uh, planted a church, some families from that same church. And, and we did it in such a way with their, their blessing. And we're still dear friends with the pastors there. And that's when I was ordained. The men of the church approached me. Would you consider being our first elder? Yes. And, and so kind of went through an examination. And I was already in charge of the church music. So it's kind of interesting how, you know, people would assume Tim Bushong, they think, you know, the mighty fortress, you're that guy. I would get <laughs> recognized on planes for glove war. And now I get recognized in an elevator. Oh, my goodness. You're a... Uh, you're yeah. the mighty fortress guy. <laughs> People might be hearing a little, uh, you know, sound bites in the background. So, because I'm, I'm on YouTube as you're talking, looking for Love oh. War, uh, and I found. So, is it all on on the Tim Bushong YouTube channel? Is that where? You know, it, it's it's not. When when I got yeah. my DistroKid account, they just put the new look. Actually, it's all on Spotify. Oh. So if you look on Spotify, you haven't taken find... your music off Spotify yet. <laughs> yeah well i don't think i'm making a big enough splash you know oh you get cnn at your house if you if you did say we're gonna take our love wars music off because joe rogan or you know something That's like that right. you, you may get a revival uh so all right so spotify is where we where stand with your brother yeah, yeah right you and neil young um yep so uh so so that's i mean that's interesting so i mean not I don't know a lot of Christian rockers who kind of made that transition uh, to being a pastor. And um, there seems to be, now I'm, I'm not huge in the Christian rock scene, but the, the, the ones that I know, even, even like, like the solid uh, ones, like I, I'm thinking of, um, Oh, uh, what's the really popular uh, striper yeah. striper, right? Striper, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I know a guy who, who worked with them pretty closely and, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, a lot of these bands, I'm not trying to pick on anyone in particular, but Stripers sure. is the one that's come just popping out in my mind because I have a friend who worked with them. They, there's there's the onstage kind of persona. There's the music. There's there's the throwing out the Bibles and all this. But then there, there, there is a connection to the corporate world, this, the the record labels. And it's inescapable. And, right. And, and that is a huge uh, pitfall temptation. Um just uh, the worldliness, right? Worldliness. So, uh, yeah. what you know, it, what's it like out there? You you've rubbed shoulders with um, with with a lot of the bands that uh, at least in the '90s were popular. Is I mean, is it like a strain on one's soul to get involved in even Christian uh, rock music or or contemporary Christian music? Is John, that's that's a great question, and. Let me say it this way. If you see something in uh, Christian music that's kind of disturbing or, you know, seems off kilter, well, you could probably find the same corollary behind the pulpit almost anywhere. The problem is when, when you're going to be committed to a band, uh, it's not just you anymore. It's these three or four other guys and you've got to tour. There's, there's no question about it. You have to hit the road. And if you're married and you got kids, it's going to be a lot harder. I know I'm thinking of two particular guys that I had great respect for back in the 90s as music uh, musicians who put out excellent material and who are both now in conservative uh, pastoral ministry. Frank Hart from Atomic Opera. Now he's a Missouri Synod Lutheran. And uh, Chris Neiswanger from the band Precious Death. He's a Presbyterian pastor down uh, just south of Memphis. Um, I'd be hard pressed. One of the problems is too that there's no middle class in music. You've either got the, you know, the really high echelon where they're really making bank and able to do it, and then there's nothing in the middle. And then all of the, the rest of us dweebs just barely scraping by, you know. And so the temptation is always going to be towards um, that kind of the allure of making some more money. 
you know, you can just imagine you're struggling, you're on the road, something comes up and, you know, I, they call it deconstruction now, but I've seen guys doing this for years and years. Uh, you know, guys who I sat next to, uh, you know, sharing the gospel with on the same stage and they, now they're, now they're deconstructing and, or, you know, going through whatever it is. There's nothing new under the sun. This is just the same old, you know, it was emergent back in the, let me turn my phone off. Sorry. Yeah, I guess it's go for it. <laughs> yeah. The, the, and, uh, you know, the emergent church that went through the same kind of thing. No. And, it, and it's weird when you're at the same time, you're talking about like art, artsy people, you know, just be creative. As long as you're saying something, that's the important part. And then you got the rest of us out here going, well, no, the content's important. You, you want to think through this, be intentional. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen some tragic uh, situations where families are just atomized, uh, divorce. And at the same time, in, again, in the middle of that, you see guys that have gone on to, uh, whether it's pastoral ministry or, uh, you know, they didn't fall away. So, you know, I, I don't know if it's endemic. I think being on the road is really hard because you're not connected to the church. That's a big problem. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's no accountability there. You can kind of get away with things as you're staying in hotels or other places. Um, By the way, let me, let me yeah. say something about Striper because sometimes they get a, a, uh, you know, people like, well, you know, this eighties metal. And I, I met and got to know Michael sweet a little when we were, we were mixing the first love war record. He was recording his first solo record. This is in the same studio in LA. And he told me with, without any hesitation that they had really gotten off the beam on, I think it was a particular record in 91 or whatever, I can't remember. But he says, yeah, I mean, we thought, hey, let's go for the brass ring on this. And it, and it almost blew up their band and a bunch of marriages. Now, Oof. thank God that didn't happen, you know. But yeah. I thought that was interesting. He's, he's like willing to say, no, that was that was a huge mistake. We, we almost ruined our lives trying to pursue something that was just ungodly. Yeah. So yeah, kudos what, to that. I mean, what advice would you have for uh, people to a young person today who wants to get involved with uh, Christian contemporary music? You know, I, I'll be honest. I've been out of that scene for, man, now it's 22 years. I, I got off the road in late 99, really didn't have much interaction. I don't even know what's going on out there. Yeah. But beyond, you didn't watch the, the Super Bowl either, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess did I. I didn't. I didn't own that stuff in the '90s, so I'm probably not going to be interested in it now. But um, no. So back to the back to that issue. Um, advice would be: first of all, music is like anything else. It's it's got these basic structures and tools and everything, and practice get really good but the but the main thing is if you're gonna you're gonna really try it you're gonna be subject to the producers and to the executives of the record companies and if you really want to be an artist forget all that we got the internet now be an independent artist put your own stuff out there and stay connected to your local church make mm -hmm. sure that your your pastors your oh, the, the members of the church the people that grew up watching you and it's not those little kids fall fall down. Now you're a teenager and you want to be a rock star. Miss Hathaway, Jethro wants to be a rock star and, and stay connected to those people. You know, they know you, they love you. They may not understand kind of your musical tastes. I get it. I, I, I like stuff that most of the people in my church are like, that's pastor Tim. He, he likes the metal. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's okay. Uh, we don't bring it into church. That's a whole, that's another topic, but, yeah, stay connected to the, the people that know you and love you and know the Bible and aren't aren't afraid to say, nah, I don't think that'd be wise, son. Why don't we try this channel, you know, or this uh, direction? Now, I've had some questions lately from people who uh, sus have a suspicion about Christian music, I guess. And I, I'm just going to be very open with everyone uh, who's listening. I, I don't really listen to... Um, the contemporary Christian music station in my area. I don't really even know what's out there. 
Uh, I, I never really did that much. And that's, I'm not trying to say that it's wrong to listen to it at all. I'm just saying it, it never appealed to me every once in a while, someone would, you know, bring a song in, into church, uh, that was popular on the radio. And, and, and sometimes it's a good song, but, uh, you know, more often than not, it, it if I ever, you know, cause I, I did get like, uh, I don't want to say dragged, but I, I did have people bring me to concerts. You know, sometimes I didn't even want to go Christian concerts, um, people I didn't know who they were. And I, most of the stuff that I'd hear, it was just, I don't know. I, I, I resonated more with, with a hymn book, um, it, it, shallow, maybe I, I don't know what of all the adjectives I could use to describe it, but shallow is the one that pops out to me the most. But uh, but I've had people asking me lately, like, hey, is the CRT stuff is uh, um, false teaching of, of any kind? Is it just coming through the music, you know, regardless of good preaching? Or are the people then the rest of the week listening to uh, music that's compromising them? And I don't really know the answer to that. But like um, but I thought maybe you'd know more about that. Do, do you see uh, false ideologies or uh what, how would you describe whatever quality that is that I'm talking about? Is it a shallowness? What is it? Okay, so that that's interesting. I, I, I kind of thought you were going to go here. So there's a principle in uh, music speaking culturally of association. So, for example, um, if uh, there's a film and the it's going to get romantic, well, they don't play John Philip Sousa. They play some nice, you know, saxophone or some nice kind of acoustic Spanish guitar and it's, you know, touch the heartstrings. Or, for example, uh, reverse that. It's Braveheart going into the battle scene. They're not playing Hillsong, you know, at that <laughs> yeah. point. They're playing something with meat to it. And so there's, there's that aspect of associating a certain style of music with a certain activity or even worldview if you want to go that far so associate now try without without making the guilt by association leap you can see that the church groups or if you want to call them the denominations or, or whatever the the movement is um watch how they worship in public watch what happens and and why is it then you know i Again, I'm kind of out of the loop. I'm with you, John. If I want to hear like songs on the radio, I'm just driving around. I got a 10 minute drive. Um, if if Alice Cooper School's Out is on, that's going to get turned up. But I think it's cool. It you know takes me back to my the halcyon days of my youth, right? So no big deal. I don't listen to Christian music. I don't know what's out there. I really appreciate what John Cooper's doing in Skillet. He's still flying the flag, and, you know, standing for truth. But just watch, watch what happens when the preaching is over, and now we're going to worship, and everybody kind of goes in this left-right weird mode, and the song comes on, there's long instrumental interludes. Those are the churches that are going woke. In, in the main, again, we're being stereotypical here. You don't want to you know, put everybody in the same basket. But why is that? Why, why are they the ones with the... With, uh, you know, paid, hired staff for all of the, you know, the litany of social justice causes, they're not singing out of the Trinity hymn book. They're not taking their cues, even from Sovereign Grace music, although some in, in our circles might. But it's more about just getting that emotional buzz, setting the stage. I was talking to my, my nephew who wants to get into apologetics. I said, watch what, watch what happens. They're going to use music to manipulate your emotions. Calvin warned about it. He said, you be careful with music because people are easily led. And back in my charismatic days, we understood it completely. You want to provide a, what we call it, a seed bed for those, uh, those sign gifts to grow. And you do that by, it's like creating an atmosphere and you do it with music. Again, you go to these big churches and when the, when the time for music comes, all the lights get lowered hmm. and they're creating an atmosphere. Look, I understand that for, for rock and roll and you know, concerts and whatnot, you know, it's all about the moment and the visceral response. And, you know, as long as there's 15 year old kids, there's going to be some kind of music that their parents hate. That's just life. Right. But in church, I don't, I don't get it because the, 
Now we're talking about a worship service that has turned into some kind of entertainment. Some Somebody's getting a buzz out of this. And I'll be honest, when we're singing at our church, which basically it's four hymns a Sunday out of a hymn book or the auxiliary hymn book, as we call it, um, I'll look out because I'm leading the worship with an acoustic guitar. We've got piano, organ, bass guitar, and acoustic guitar. And I will, I will look and see people genuinely moved by the music and by the lyrics. You know, uh, how firm a foundation when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie. You can see the tears. Now, listen, we're not doing that on purpose. That Our intention isn't to give you a buzz and make you feel all emotional. But it naturally has that. And I think there's a difference between the, the programmatic, somewhat canned, formulaic, music that is intended to give you an emotional buzz and the natural result of a, a spirit born uh, hymn that has stood the test of time. And there, there's a reason it's still in the books. Okay. Yeah. yeah they, they stood the test of time for not because of, you know, I heard some guy in my studio, dude, this is like back in 06. The only reason that Mozart and Beethoven are in the canon of Western music is and you can guess what he said. He was going to college. <laughs> That's because they're white. Oh, I see. White European. Yeah. You know, it was just the dumbest thing. Right. No. But back to reality in the hymn books, it's what people want to sing. <clears throat> Let me say one more thing. Yeah. Wherever you want. I've had more people come up to me in the last two years and say, I just don't get it. We'll be at church. And they're trying out all this new stuff. And I know it's on whatever Christian radio it is. And nobody, it's kind of like men don't know what to do with their hands. We raise them or put them down. And, you know, it's just all awkward <laughs> and stuff. And then they do the obligatory hymn for the old people. And the place erupts. Everybody sings. And it's loud and boisterous. Yeah. And they're like, why wouldn't they put two and two together? Even if it's purely pragmatic, sing more hymns. Well, because they're, they're, they're kind of trying to be cool and relevant and ends up being uncool and irrelevant. You know, I remember uh, years ago, I went to, uh, this tells you how many years ago it was, I went to a Desiring God conference in, uh, at Rick Warren's church. Yes, I was there. Um, this was, <laughs> I want to say, this got to be like uh, 12 years, 13 years ago. You got the COVID, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, it tested negative. I, I, I've heard you can't give it over zoom so it's, i'm not giving it to you but uh um it, it is nasty stuff uh anyway I, so i was at this church and i wasn't there for rick warren i was there because you know at the time i really you know like john piper and and um uh I, I, they had i think it was like five separate services uh for and it was all based on music style it wasn't based on anything else, you know, different series they're going through, different education levels. N nowadays, you know, maybe different ethnicities. It wasn't anything like that. It was yeah. music styles. That was the, the thing that divided people as a significant factor. I thought that was fascinating. Uh, and it was like five different ones. Was, I was like, wow, you can you know, pretty much any style you want. You just go to the service and it, you'll have the same message, but a different music. And, yeah. and it shows you how important music style is to people, that, that this is a definitional identity thing. And, and especially in California, people, you know, out there, they don't even ask you what genre. They just say, well, yeah, what band do you like? Right. And you like mer you <laughs> your whole life is formed around this band or something. Uh, and uh, and so um, I, I just I thought that was a fascinating thing because. Uh, it shows the power that music has and it is something people they gravitate towards certain styles for certain reasons. And so when, when you have a church, like you just described, uh, decide, you know, as one worship uh, music leader told me once, you know, we're going to, we're going to have a special service for the older people and bring out some of the hymns, but I'm going to change everything. And we're going to go all contemporary. Um, it's, it is a fundamental, there's a fundamental transformation going on. Uh, and and it, it, because it's art, I think sometimes it, it's hard to quantify it or understand exactly what's happening, but something is happening in that. And um, and so, I, you know, what I hear you saying is that the, the social justice isn't necessarily coming in through music, but there is a it, it, it's it's an association that, that the people who 
would be susceptible to social justice, they're going to like, they're going to be more inclined to enjoy certain styles. Um, and, and, and those styles tend to be more, uh, you know, I was using the word shallow, but maybe is it man centered? Is that a good word to use? What do you think? Well, possibly, you know, we, you could make the argument that as long as the lyrics are sound, the music doesn't matter. You know, that that's an, it's kind of an old, and I'll call it a canard because I don't quite agree. Again, going back to the appropriate association, that's actually teleological. That's the appropriate, uh, like Schaefer talked about, the little humpback Ro Roman bridges in Switzerland. They were fine for carrying a, you know, a legion of soldiers because they don't weigh that much, but a modern two-ton truck would just break it. So there are certain, seems to be certain musical styles that are, uh, more fitting for certain lyrical accounts or, uh, you know, lyric content. Um, and so whether, whether or not there's explicit, you know, you might, you might find a song or two there that talks about our, our church needs to look like heaven and, you know, they're going with the uh, all nations. It, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty hard to do that in Finland, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you guys need to look more like uh, Zimbabwe. Well, it's you know? hard. It's, it's hard to do that in Indiana. <laughs> yeah, how about it? I mean, and really, you can drive. You can drive 25 minutes from my house, and there's going to be many more people from Hispanic descent. Okay, that church is going to look different. I don't. I don't feel that I should obligate anyone that lives 25 minutes or half hour away. We're talking about the country. You know, people in the city are like, yeah, big deal, 20-minute drive. Um, I don't want them to feel obligated that they need to come to our church. It, it's not about that. And so, really, we, we know that the unity is already bought and paid for by the Lord Jesus. The, the dividing wall of hostility has been broken down. So, so then now we're talking about preferences. And I think that was probably driving the Desiring God conference we want to appeal to people based on their preferences. Now, if, you, if you've been paying attention, you know that always gets turned back around on the old uh, hymn people. You know, well, you need to sacrifice your preferences so we can bring in this other stuff. Uh, I'll just mention the worship band at this year's SBC conference. I, I was like, guys, really? This is necessary? You, you think this is good? Nobody sang along until the hymns came. Even with that setting, it was like, that's just weird, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that there's a certain kind of youth culture that, as Churchill said, if you're, if you're not liberal at 20, you're heartless. If you're not conservative by 40, you're brainless. There's something to that. He, he's not far off. What do you think now, drives? Thank, thank yeah, sorry, no, what? sorry. I, I cut you off a little bit there. You can fin finish your sentence there. No, I said, we think uh, we've got you know young people in our church that are you know eyes wide open you know based on the word not not being led by their emotions and I think that's probably part of where you're where you're going with this is it's easier to lead people emotionally and by gum don't we know that that's part of the playbook coming from the critical race people and social justice people it's yeah. not about logic and facts it's about how that person's feeling and how they were tricked. And that, uh, that kind of plays in there, John. Yeah, that no, that makes perfect sense to me. And I think that's what people are sensing when, when they ask me that, about this. You know, hey, is it coming yeah. through the music? It's not in the preaching, maybe, but is it coming through the music? And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I, what kind of music are you listening to? Oh, there's no lyrics yeah. that seem like they're, they're not talking about white privilege. But um, but yeah, right. OK, I can see how if you if you have a bunch of people that are uh, just very open and, and to, to any you, you get open, you get numb, I guess, when you when you have certain styles. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you. So I, I remember this is during the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. I was in Wake Forest, North Carolina, going to seminary at Southeastern, and we were still looking for a church. And we, you know, every Sunday I got to hear a new rendition of A Mighty Fortress. Right. Every single Sunday. Now, of course, you yeah. have your your rendition, right, for the dividing line, which now you don't do that rendition in church, I'm assuming. That's or, or do you? Maybe you do. As, as much as that is the desire of my heart. No. <laughs> right. Because it would be hard to sing. I think that's the so, so you have a regimented. Yeah, my, That's my rock. Tim rock voice range. I, I, I changed the key of the song to match about is where I'm comfortable 
on 10 or 11 with the voice, you yeah. know, in church, it's lower key. That's why my version of Psalm two has that kind of, it's, it's a different vocal because I'm, I'm playing it as written. Well, that's how a congregation would sing. And it's much lower, you know? So, you know, it's funny that, that came out. Um, I, w- I had a little bit of a uh, time break, April of 2015. And I actually reached out to Rich Pierce and said, Hey, if I sent you a, different version of what you guys have because because i think the topic needs back to the you know what would be the appropriate music you're talking about the most basic fundamental theology you need something heavy and he said oh send it on so i made it exactly the same length as the uh, steve green version with right. the exact same quote and so he didn't get a chance to play it until later in the summer and that's when that's when james white looks up and goes i can tell you one thing when I was a kid, I wouldn't have been allowed to listen to that music. <laughs> <laughs> I just loved that because it's like we're the same age, and that, that was my background, you know. Yeah. So, well, no, we don't do that version. We we do a version that's appropriate to all ages singing. Singing. That's. I wouldn't, that's want, the... I wouldn't want someone running out of the church going, "Oh no, no, no!" You know. That right. Be cool. Well, and then that goes back to hearing 50 versions of this song and they have a little chorus they add in and you can't figure out like, you know, when the timing's all off and, and they, it's like every band wanted to make it their own when I went and, and no one was singing. I hate that. No one was singing. I hate that. And For, when I survey the wondrous cross is a great hymn. When you add, oh, the wonder. You're offending people now. <laughs> yeah now it's turning into six minutes and it and it and it went all weird on us man no no <laughs> yeah, i agree with you uh so yeah the aversion i think that i have to it and some people do is um you singability is a huge factor in this the you know, songs uh worship yep. songs are meant to be sung you're supposed to everyone should be able to participate somehow and if it's if the range is off you can't do it if um that's right if the 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 melody and the and the the orchestration just don't match the lyrics that you're conveying, like that doesn't fit. Uh, and so I think that's that should be the point is as a corporate body, we're singing to the Lord. We're singing, we're get, are offering him praise. We want him to hear our voices right. and and together and not involved. I think what you you alluded to this when you said the lights go down often, it's not an individual experience. I mean, even though there could be things in your own heart that are individual to you, but it, you're not you know, you're not ignoring the rest of the room and just, uh, you know, getting in your own worship thing. And not, not that that's always wrong, but when you come together as a corporate body, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's everyone together. It, it's so, uh, right. s- singing to one another, right. With Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, right. making melody in your yeah. hearts to the Lord. Um, and so, uh, so I, I wonder whether or not social justice activists, right. Who are all about, they just talk about, we got to come together. We got to do some corporate thing. We got corporate repentance, corporate this. But then when it comes down to it, they're very man centered, very individualistic. Uh, and that comes through even in the yeah. music, I think, yeah. uh, sometimes. Um, yeah. Well, think about the uh, wh- when I was first ordained and I was, we were already planning on uh, what, how our worship service was going to look like. How are we going to, quote, do church? Right. And my mom is a music teacher, still still alive. Hi, mom. And she gave me great advice. She goes, now, listen, when you when you look at a hymnal, you got to remember, A, that was put together by committee. B, the committee is probably in their late middle age, maybe even, you know, in their 60s. So they're going to be gravitating towards the songs that they grew up with rather than this kind of objective, let's look at all the music and, and put it all together. What do we think a hymn book in 2045 is going to look like are people going to are, are we going to see these you know like super popular christian songs still being sung i i'm going to go on record and say i don't think so i don't think they're going to make it through the filter even though the committee's trying to go why well, I, I used to like that song you know, think about all the all the different uh you know, popular worship songs to the 80s and 90s People still sing Majesty by Jack Hayford. You don't think Days of He's Elijah is going to make pastor. it? Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. not going to make the cut in so 2045. What, what, okay, what, 
what's the most popular worship song you'll you'll always hear and i can guarantee you i haven't even heard it i can only imagine what that song is i can only imagine yeah <laughs> i've never heard it you've never heard I, that song? actually heard i heard a little bit of it and thought well that's not very good oh my goodness now like you're really it. offending people <laughs> well but that's again that's my preference i prefer uh, crown him with many crowns and lead on, O King Eternal, and yeah, you know, all hail the power. I even like uh, 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 some of the some of the more modern nineteenth century stuff. They that can actually be good. But what I really like, and and you hit your you hit the nail on the head. This is supposed to be sung by a group of people all together, and so you find you find some of those cool old bluesy Sacred Heart. Uh, songs, you know, from from the early, from the late 18th, early 19th century, and oh boy, those are excellent. Sometimes the, the lyrics are like, how do they put so much theology in such a little space? Just like economical with their words, compacted, and it's so good. Yeah. Well, this this is not a critique. This is an observation, and I, I think what you're saying is right. Those revivalist hymns, uh, they're they're meant to be sung corporately. There's um, a, a lot of them, at least today. I even see in conservative. So these would be the songs that I am more familiar with just because I hear them in church often. But uh, it's just Sovereign Grace, Gettys. Uh, who else is that? Matt Papa. I don't I don't know. There's, there's a whole yeah. kind of. Yeah, the whole group there. Um, oftentimes, I've noticed that the, the songs are, are very much the same and they're all good as far as the theme. You know, I'm, I was a sinner. Christ saved me. Uh, and now I'm you know yeah. living for him or something. Right. That's like. And so it's very um, it, it's true. It's good, but it's very individualistic. And, and it, if, if you sing a lot of that, that's your diet, right? Um, that's all that you're, you're playing that story all the time. And, and you just mentioned some yeah. hymns like Lead on King Eternal, uh, uh, you know, Onward Christian Soldiers. I mean, I don't hear those songs being written at all. Uh, you don't hear songs about heaven all that much anymore. Like I'll Fly yeah. Away or In the Sweet By and By. Uh, you, till when we all get to heaven. I don't hear that much anymore. And I, and I don't know why that is. I, I, I really don't. Um, but it, it is interesting to me that we've kind of, it, I, I view it as like a dinner plate and we've decided somewhere along the line, we just really want to eat one course. And there's all these other courses that the scripture all I gives want us. Pasta. I just want the pasta. I, just, I don't even want sauce on the pasta, right? And it's like, right. pasta is good. I love pasta, but, uh, you know, there's maybe some chicken or some meatballs with that pasta and, and some vegetables right. or so, uh, you know, do you, I don't know if you thought of that. If you, if you have an explanation, is that a cultural moment that we're in or is, does that go along with the sort of this in, the emotional individual experience? Why do you think that is? All right. So a couple, that great stuff, great observations, John. And again, no one should watch this and, and go, well, he's insulting my favorite I'm, music. Yeah, I'm not trying to okay. at all. I love the you know, there, you, that That can carry off into, you know, you didn't like that film? How could he not like Forrest Gump? My goodness. You know, it's like enough already. You know, this is part of this is preference. And I, and honestly, we I think we would have to be uh, nature, grace, dualist at the most extreme to not agree that some of this is in the eye of the beholder. Some of it. Just the, the initial visceral response to something you first hearing, because it's all coming through the ears, it's auditory. Well, it's you know, similar to beauty being in the eye of the beholder, right? Okay, someone for everyone. Praise God for that. Um, I, could, I could think of like three different bands where I remember right where I was sitting when I first heard them and I went, wow, that's different. That's cool. I like that. Okay. Take that and apply it back to our hymn committee who put together the Baptist hymnal in 1975. There are some editorial choices in there that I do not understand. And I think it was reflective of their theology at the time. So, uh, you know, for, for such a worm as I has been replaced for sinners such as I, you know, you don't want to think of yourself too low, like a worm, right? What's one of the most famous verses in, in all of Toplady's hymns? Rock of Ages, verse 4, uh, Nothing in my hands I bring, only to thy cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress. 
That verse just isn't even there. It's, it's gone. Why? Why did they feel like that would be inappropriate to include in a hymn on 75? But then remember, all these people are probably about 60, 65 years old. They're remembering the revivals when they were kids and the Moody Sankey. And what were those songs about? It's about my personal experience. It's about what, what it, it could even be. This is what God done, has done for me. You ask me how I know he lives? Well, Romans 1, Psalm 19. No, no, no. It's a, utterly personal, lives within my heart. Mm -hmm. Well, again, there's nothing new. Some of these songs are just like that. They're talking about what your personal experience has been. And by the way, I'm not against experience. Again, people will take what I'm saying and say, oh, so you must be opposed to any you know, existential. No, I just said people will ball when they're singing, all oh, creatures of our God and King. Praise, praise the Father. For, oh, my goodness. Yeah. So I think part of it is that that kind of mentality that was probably coming into the fore during the Prohibition era, during the Civil War on after through that kind of part of the whole i'll say it feminization of the church and if you ask any christian radio dj who is their primary fundamental audience who are they trying to reach what's it going to be housewives it, it, yeah between the age of 28 and 40 yep yep because they pay the bills yeah I, i've seen other genres go that same direction uh, too, yeah. for, for the, it seems like they're all kind of going that direction. Uh, and so that, here's, that's, a, here's the yeah. other thing, John, I think that when, when a church intentionally gears their music towards a certain demographic, what does that say about every other demographic? You kind of like, you're not really that, it's not that critical that we either keep you. It's, it's like a, you know, local, uh, local town giving, uh, property tax abatements to the new businesses. What about the rest of us who have stuck it out all these years? How's that fair? You know, right. well, in a way it's like the old person in the pew and they said, well, we've decided that, you know, the, the early service is traditional and the late service is more contemporary, but now we've got people coming to all of them. So we're just going to make the whole thing contemporary. They kind of throw you under the bus in the name of being relevant, I guess. And again, I go back to the, People that have come to me and said, "Man, when they when they pull out uh, name the hymn, you know, it is well with my soul." The place erupts. I mean, the decibel level gets noticeably higher because everyone sings. Come on, right. get, yeah, get I, I I think that's excellent because what I hear you saying is that there are uh, objective elements to music and there's subjective elements. There's there's two different yep. elements here, and and so there's some criteria. You know, you want singability. You want good theology. Uh, you, you want um, uh, all ages and, and the people who are coming to the church to, part, to, be, to participate, to be able to participate. Yeah. Um, you, you know, th these are some, some like essential elements that you and we'll find that in, in, in Scripture, I think, as well. We're going to find uh, that it's, it's all people coming together, one voice to the Lord. You see this even in, in the example of ancient Israel. Yeah. Uh, and, and then there's a, these subjective elements um, and, and maybe one more objective. I don't, I don't even know. This is kind of on that, that, that border of whether it's objective or subjective, because there's elements to, to this that are both, but you want the mode to match the message. Right. Uh, and, and so yeah. all, all of that, that's kind of a given. Um, and, and then the, the subjective elements would just be like, you know, what style do you, do you really like to listen to it? Instrumentation sounds good. Uh, the some to some extent perhaps the decibel level you know as long as it's not hurting your ears you know some people like it louder some people like it softer uh and, and those things we can probably have just grace with one another i'd think we can just yeah i mean i'm not big into that song but look i can sing it you can sing it like let's let's worship together and, and that's fine yeah. if, if it's not yeah. my favorite you um, know people would assume because i did a lot of touring in 97 especially 97 98 99 i was on the road before and all that but so I would always make it a point to uh, drive through the night Saturday so I could be at church with my family. Mm -hmm. And there were times where, you know, I'm, I'm outside the band van at seven in the morning shaving 
doing the uh, <laughs> the road shower, and I would just drive to the church, and my wife and kids would meet me there, and we'd worship together. You know, everybody had this assumption that since I like edge edgier, funkier, heavier, harder music, that that's what I would really like in church. Mm. And it's polar opposite. I mean, last year at the uh, the founders conference. All they had was Bob Coughlin with a piano. And this is at, uh, Mc, not McLean, but it's the, it's the big church where they're having. Anyway, big room, huge room. They could, they could have had a huge band up there. It would have been fine, whatever. But it was just him and a piano. And, of course, Bob is very experienced. He knows what he's doing. He, he, and he, I think he's just a godly man. Some of his songs are really good. Uh, but, boy, oh, boy, let me tell you, when it got to – Christ, the sure and steady anchor. I was blubbering like a baby. Now, it didn't take lowering the lights or the perfect guitar hits or any of that stuff. All it is, is I'm thinking second verse, deeper still goes the anchor. I could thank you, God, right? Mm. Same thing. Um, you know, one guy with an acoustic guitar can do just fine. You don't need all the bells and whistles. And hopefully, again, like you mentioned, singability. It seems to be, okay, can, can everyone kind of join in this? I understand there are going to be more difficult songs for all the saints who from their labors. Are, great, whatever. <laughs> but, but after you sing it about three times, you know it. Yeah. And little kids know it. I, I absolutely love it. At, at the end of the service, we, we all raise our hands in the air, and we either sing the doxology or the Gloria Patri. And there's a number of larger families and their kids are like full volume, not mm. on pitch. And it's glorious. All those notes being sanctified by the spirit of God to his throne. And it's beautiful without any instrumentation. Yeah. Uh, worship is, is something that uh, takes place, whether, I mean, it's something the spirit does. Right. So, yeah, um, it, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you, know, here's, you ever, you remember Cornerstone Festival? Were you old enough for that to be a thing? I, I, I don't know. I don't remember okay. that. Sorry. <laughs> so in the, in the eighties and, and through the nineties, that was the play. If you're a Christian rock band, you got to play Cornerstone. And it's, it's the best. Glenn Kaiser had a musicians, music musicians and ministry course that he would go through. One year he brought in Dr. Harold Best, who was the professor of music at Wheaton. Now this is 88. So Wheaton's not woke yet. Great. Anyway, he made, he made the outstanding assumption, uh, statement that if we were relying on certain music styles in order to be able to worship, we were idolaters. Mm. Now, I was just a young Christian at the time. Now, and I was like, oh, I see what he means. Because that, that makes a thing on the same level as the Spirit of God. That's taking uh. the thing. Because you got a room full of these you know, long hair, wannabe Christian rock guys. And he's saying, y'all are squares. You don't even sing hymns anymore. You're, you're squares. And it, there's one more thing I'll relate, and then wh wherever you want to go. But yeah. years ago, I had an old buddy of mine, really sharp theologically, you know, spot on, reads, reads all the big books. you know. So he came and visited the church. And after the worship service, he was walking around with this weird kind of dumbfounded, glazed over expression like, have a, have a, have a. I said, hey, it was so good to see you. You know, I know you had to make a little drive. And he looked up at me and says, I can't believe it. I'm the traditionalist. <laughs> I'm the one stuck in a rut. Because all he had experienced for 20 years is, you know, thumping rock band, 25 minutes, slower song, lower the lights. And then, and then we got to hear a sermon. It was so funny. I was like, yeah, I know. I know. It's cool. <laughs> I'm funny. the traditionalist. Uh, I want I want to read uh, that, that is funny. I want to read some some verses just for everyone uh, on this topic. This isn't necessarily exhaustive, but uh, Colossians three says, "Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God." Uh, so it is commanded to sing, uh, and and we do have different genres coming out: psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Um, there is supposed to be wisdom in this, right? So there there's you know, that that's where you're not letting the uh, 20 year old um, 
punk rock star pick out all the songs that you do, right? Because he's the hip, cool guy. You, you know, there's wisdom in this. There's, there's a congregational yeah. uh, element and elders should have some oversight in, in a church. Um, and neither do you let the 61-year-old Rocker, right, right. Choose a right. bunch of old hard rock songs. Right. No. That's yeah. You don't. Play, you don't let right? that happen either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. You, you, throughout the Psalms, so many verses. Uh, Psalm 105. Sing to Him. Sing praises to Him. Tell of His wondrous, wondrous works. Uh, right. Psalm 150 uh, has. Uh, this is where I mean, some people will bring up the regulative principle: you shouldn't have instruments or something. And and you know, Psalm 150. I just it mentions. Uh, the trumpet, the lute, the harp, tambourine, dance, even. I, I know that's making some Baptists really nervous now. Oh, yeah. Uh, the strings, pipes, cymbals. I mean, this is a loud uh, display that's happening uh, yep. in, in Psalm 150. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, you see a lot when people are joyful throughout, especially David, throughout the Psalms, he sings. That's what he does, right? It's uh, what am I going to do? How am I going to express the praise that I have? And And that's um, that's how I think about it. Uh, John, John 4, 24 says, uh, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And in that same okay. passage, it says, God's God searching for these worshipers. And so that's, that's how I view, you know, music in the church. It's an, it's an overflow. It's an outpouring is, you know, how could we not react when, when our God is so good, when this, these are his attributes, we, we have to sing about them. Um, and that that's going to be an emotional experience because of the truth that's deep in, in us more than anything else. Uh, well, that's, and, that's interesting. We kind of structure our worship as hymns that are in response to something that just took place. So it's not all like all four hymns, 20 minutes, all at the same time. It's like this, then we confess other things. Then we sing a hymn in response to that. It kind of builds up to that. Right. I, love, I can't remember the song where it's a constant, uh, call and response between the what would be the, the worship leader and the people. Uh, there's a couple old Baptist hymns that do that, and they're fun because <laughs> the kids get it real fast. And then you've got the whole topic of singing psalms themselves. Yeah, you know, yeah. do we sing? We're, we're working on it. We've got we probably have ten in rotation now, and 140 to go. By the way, wouldn't it be ironic for a uh, uh, exclusive psalmody? And regulative principal church to sing 150. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I, I mean, it, there, there's so many. I, I've been in so many different churches too, where the styles are different, but they they're all worshiping, and and that's yeah, yeah. You, know, you can do it with. I mean, people that go to Africa, right, and they're hearing a totally different style, but the people are participating. They're singing great truths. Um, so, so there is a, a distinction, I think, uh, we're saying between music in the church and then what you were doing uh, out on the road. There's sort of the contemporary yeah. Christian industry. That, that's, there is an entertainment element to that, which, and it's not wrong, right? But it's not, right. we, we, don't, we don't think that that is necessarily always appropriate for uh, a Lord's Day service, necessarily. Exactly. Exactly. That's um, in, our, in our catechism. Well, we, we just went to using wine and communion. And even in our confession of faith, it talks about how the, the minister um, you know, distributes, it sets them apart from normal lunch. You know, the bread and wine, the Lord's Supper, this isn't just, you know, breakfast. It's different. I think that's the same thing. It is the Lord's service. It's his, right? And and in, in view of the, the goal to have everyone feel like they're involved and uh, not just welcome, you know, because that's sometimes the argument. How are you going to welcome the biker if you don't play Born to be Wild? That's kind of <laughs> silly. No one would have thought of that in the first century. You know? Right, right. How, how is that gladiator going to feel at home unless you do those, Man, uh, yeah. these kind of performance you know, mode? Um, but all, <laughs> all of that is, is right on, John. I mean, think about we want, we want people to sing together when it's a kind of flow naturally, even, even if it's a challenging song, that's cool. Uh, practice it, learn it, and, and just let God do what God does. I think we've experienced, you know, our growth in our local church just by saying, God, you do what you do, and we want to be faithful to you. And again, if, if we had a drum kit, we would have a full rock band. We just haven't found anyone that's good enough yet. So. Well, well, a little story for you. Um, 
I remember my dad's a pastor. So I remember when I was in youth group, right. I've seen more battles over music than almost anything else. And, uh, and, and I would say for the last, uh, I don't know, 20 or 15 years, there really haven't been problems in the music ministry. But, uh, but before that, when I was in my more early teens, uh, there, there was a guy I remember who really wanted to bring in punk rock, right? Put the graffiti on the trash cans, put them on top of the baptismal, get the smoke machines out. Let's really, yeah, yeah right. And, and, little, and little baby mohawks, you know, <laughs> actually, I think maybe one of them did have a mohawk. So, um, and, and so we're going to, you know, we're doing some punk rock here and, um, and we're going to get the kids in that way, right? That's the way to do it. And it, it was right. more of a youth group type activity. And so my dad and I think another parent were sitting downstairs and all of a sudden the floor starts flexing and, and he's, he's like, well, you know, what's going on? What's, what's happening up there. And, and I think he contemplated turning off the power to the entire church at that moment uh, because the, the guys on the stage, uh, the, you know, leading this wanted all the kids in the youth group to jump up and down. It was awkward at first. It wasn't natural. Right. Like it, well, these youth group kids are like, what? And he's like, no, you got to jump up and down, you know, is trying to okay. get, yeah, artificially produce this this environment that would you know try to attract the worldly kids, and um, and so some parents got upset about it and thought you know my kids you know this isn't it's not good for their hearing it's not you know whatever it, you know some parents probably were fine with it some kids probably liked it some but they, you know some didn't it wasn't there wasn't agreement on that this was the way to go, and, and one of the things that stood out to me and I I, I remembered this is that. Um, I remember my dad saying something to he's like look i admire the heart that you have in this but the thing to do would be you know take this style that you're saying that the kids at the high school like and go to the high school or like go to a venue um where where those people congregate and use it as an evangelism tool you know yep. don't don't bring that all into the church and then expect that you know we should just get used to doing what what people in the world are doing necessarily like with garbage right. cans expect with the church to adapt to that cultural manifestation Right. And, and, yeah. and, and, and then attract them with the right things, you know, and when they come to you and they, you know, they're crying and they, they, they want to confess their sin, you know, you, you can invite them to church and, and it's yeah. going to resonate with them. You don't need some extra like, you know, style to get them in because they are, they don't want to come in. They, the spirit of God's working on them. And yeah. I, I just thought, wow, that's, that is the way it's supposed to be done. You don't need an extra thing. And it's the motive. That's the thing I was trying to get at is it's the motive behind all of it that's the important part is you know why are you doing what you're doing like like your dad your dad exhibited pastoral wisdom he didn't he didn't squash their zeal for christ he was trying to channel it in the right way like like you do with a a teenager who's you know testosterone is off the chart you want him to be a man but it's going this way so no this way this way it's, it's disciplined and tamed and and appropriate to the situation right right so um so anyway uh i i just wanted to um yeah pick your brain on this and i think this is very helpful uh where where can people find your music if they want to uh, get your hymns album or your christmas album or, or anything else um i'm on all the all the digital platforms if you look up tim bush on on uh those platforms you'll find my hymn cd we're actually planning on volume two battle hymns for weary souls okay uh and uh by the way michael foster gave me that title in about two seconds i said i need a I need a hymn title and he just blurted it out i'm like well, thanks that's a marketing guy uh my <laughs> christmas stuff and you can find love war on there you can find the channel surfers on there and i've got a facebook page that kind of c- handles all my musical endeavors and um so yeah it's it's good um i was just going to say that what you said about taking it out taking that punk band and and playing out somewhere right absolutely but stay connected to your church yeah you know, have it all man yeah all right so uh in closing uh everyone's going to hear the 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 riff so that that is tim bushong on his guitar and uh, you can go um, I, I guess there's not a sign up yet for the conference in the fall, but you, they can email you. Um, I have wow. that on the website, actually at worldviewconversation.com. You go to speaking and you'll see October 22nd at Syracuse, Indiana, Jesus and politics conference. Uh, and then Tim's emails right there. If you have questions or, uh, yep. 
uh, it, you know, concerns, or you want to call him a heretic because of something he said on this podcast, don't message me about that message, Tim. He right. will take all your questions. How dare you speak ill of elevation in any way? Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, Tim. Hey, God bless. Uh, thanks for carving out some time for us. I know you're, you're busy as a pastor, but I, I think it's helpful for people. So. Well, thank you so much, John. It's great to, great to interact here, and I look forward to seeing you in October. All right. Get around the campfire again, buddy. Oh, yes. Yeah. Looking forward to it. All right. God bless. Bye now. All right. Thanks.